Hi, I'm Chris Orstrom. I'm the chairman of the World Monuments Fund. And I want to welcome all of you here. And, and I'm just thrilled to see what a turnout we have on a big night like this when there's so much else going on. Um, on behalf of Bonnie Burnham and the uh, board of the World Monuments Fund, I want to welcome you to the first annual Anand Family Lecture. Our board member, Vijay Anand, and his lovely wife, Nanda, and their children have funded this lecture series in the hopes that these lectures will inform and inspire you about the remarkable architectural heritage of India and encourage support for preservation of this heritage for future generations. I'd also really like to take this moment to thank Vijay and Ananda so much for their energy and their leadership. And really, you know, with these two, it's not just hard work and leadership, but really for bringing an element of fun. Whenever I'm with you, it doesn't seem like we're working, it just seems like we're, we're having a fun and there's a big spark. So thank you so much for all of this. As you know, WMF has been working in India for over 20 years and has joined with organizations there on the preservation of a wonderful range of landmarks from the 12th century walls of a spectacular fort at Jaisalmer to remote Buddhist temples in the Himalayas to the legendary Taj Mahal and to the fascinating 19th century synagogue in Mumbai. And we currently are working with the Archaeological Survey of India on two of the famous gardens created by the Mughal emperors and their court along the banks of the river in Agra around the Taj Mahal. Uh, WMF is currently expanding its efforts in India and we're proud to have recently incorporated World Monuments Fund India. And we're also very delighted and proud to announce that the chairman of WMF India is the Maharaja of Jodhpur. With the continuing growth of the Indian economy, there's increasing opportunity to generate funding for heritage conservation and preservation projects in that country. There are also many Indian people who are now living outside of India but continue to have a very strong interest in what's happening in their home country. And there are, of course, many of others here, like all of us, who love the culture of India. Thus, we are currently working to expand our constituency and the constituency for projects in India, both here and abroad. So now I turn to our speaker tonight. William Dalrymple is one of the great experts on India and the Islamic world. Islamic world, sorry about that. He has published some nine books on the subject, including most recently, Nine Lives, In Search of the Sacred in Modern India. He writes regularly for a number of publications and is the co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literary Festival. We're delighted that he is able to stop off here in New York tonight on his way to the first ever Jaipur Literary Festival in Boulder, Colorado this weekend. <laughs> Mr. Dalrymple is also a contributing writer to the book that Rizzoli is publishing this month to commemorate World Monuments Fund's 50th anniversary, and that's going to be titled World Monuments, 50 Irreplaceable Sites to Discover, Explore, and Champion. William Dalrymple's talk tonight is entitled Heavenly Paradise and Earthly Reconciliation, the creation of the Mughal Gardens at Agra. And without further ado, it's up to you, William. Is this working? Can you hear? Yeah. I hope there aren't uh, too many uh, garden uh, lovers and historians in this audience because uh, there'll be rather fewer gardens and rather more monuments this evening. Um, what I plan to do is to talk about the work that the World Monuments Fund is doing and is about to do uh, in Agra and uh, highlight some of the, um, uh, so the, the state that some of the monuments are in and, and, and what the World Monuments Fund hopes to do with them. Uh, it's not just the gardens, but also the, uh, the buildings attached to them. Now, if you were standing on the 
ramparts of the Agra fort uh, in around 1600. You would have been at the center of uh, an empire which stretched over most of uh, modern India, modern Bangladesh, modern Pakistan, quite a chunk of Afghanistan, uh, and a slither of modern Iran. Uh, it was the greatest empire of its time, both in terms of uh, its sort of military power uh, and in its economic might. For the sort of grubby Europeans appearing on its coast in sort of cod pieces, these sort of Bruegelian figures uh, tripping over themselves to become part of this, uh, this was an almost mythical land of uh, riches and opportunity. So much so that the specific dynastic name, Mughal, has remained sort of uh, petrified into the English language. So that today when you open a tabloid newspaper and read about a Hollywood mogul or a property mogul, uh, you unconsciously trip over the name of this dynasty, which has become effectively synonymous in the English language with power and wealth. The writer Milton sitting in Puritan England, writing Paradise Lost, sat trying to think of a way of communicating to his black-clothed Puritan brethren how the, the full wonder of man's possibility. And he came up with the idea uh, in Paradise Lost of God taking Adam on a tour of the future wonders of humanity. If a writer today was to do it, he might visit Manhattan and, and take Adam on a past the Asian society up Park Avenue or possibly to the new, to the new business centers of Shanghai or even uh, the bustling 26 million population of, of New Delhi. But in at this period, he took them to Agra and to Lahore, uh, which in terms of population in the 17th century constituted a world beyond all European imagining. If you'd taken the entire population of London, Paris, uh, and even Lisbon, and added them together, they wouldn't have matched the population of, of modern, uh, of, of 17th century Lahore. And you get in the writings of the early Jesuits and the first visitors to these towns, this sort of awed respect for what was going on uh, in these cities. Speaking of Agra, the Jesuit father Antonio Montserrat wrote, with regards to either size, population, or wealth, it is second to none in Asia or Europe. It is crowded with merchants who foregather there from all over Asia. There is no art or craft useful to the human life which is not practiced there. The citadel alone has a circumference of three miles. The same wonder at what this dynasty was doing is communicated in the writings of the contemporaries, who, the provincials writers coming into Agra from elsewhere in India. What a city, wrote uh, Abu Talib Kalim, a perfume garden newly in flower. Its buildings have grown tall like cypress trees. Uh, in the museum in Jaipur, the Maraj Sawai Man Singh Museum, uh, you can find this extraordinary map of Agra, which was painted in 1720. Now, according to the traditional history books, the Mughal Empire disappeared at the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. But uh, when this map was painted, the Mughals still controlled, although there was much civil unrest and the Marathas were uh, rolling around the hills around Bombay and uh, raiding various parts of the Mughal Empire. But by 1720, nonetheless, the Mughal Empire still nominally controlled all the territory between Kabul and Madras. And in fact, the um, first Nizam of Hyderabad had effectively expanded Mughal control in the south by taking the Carnatic. Uh, it still was the center uh, of a vast empire. And if you look at this map of 
Agra in 1720. Uh, you can see that this is the Agra, this is the capital uh, of an empire hanging rather like an overripe peach, huge and inviting, clearly already in decay, destined soon to fall and disintegrate, but at its most sort of luscious and soft and juicy. Uh, and uh, what it shows, if you, or rather, if you look at what Eber Koch has managed to derive out of this map, is an extraordinary riverine city built like Venice around canals uh, and the riverfront of the Yamuna. And today, as anyone knows who's been to Agra, uh, it's a, uh, a rough town dominated by the leather mafia. And one visits it by road and, and wanders around by land. But at this period in history, everything was dominated by the river. And just as you can never understand Venice unless you see it from a boat, so Agra has to be understood from the waterfront and, and envisaged as this city built around a river. It's centered around the U-shaped curve of the Amana Riverbank. Uh, and movement took place mainly by, mo by boat between the succession of riverine palaces bounded by what Abu Talib called sweet-smelling gardens with sweet blossoms. This riverine palescape spanned both banks of the Amuna. Some of the gardens were con uh, contained residential dwellings, others were pu purely for pleasure, and some contained monuments uh, of the noble or imperial dead. These geometrically laid out water gardens, alive with fountains and lattice pavilions, were built to give a hint, an approximation on earth, of the heavenly paradise. The English word paradise is derived from an ancient Persian insight that the purest form of bliss is to sport in a paradesa, a walled garden. The word came westwards with Xenophon, who coined it, who coined from it the Greek word paradesoi, from which both the Latin paradisum and the English word paradise both derive. The city of Agra was thus consciously constructed as a symbol the flowering of the empire under the rule of its greatest dynasty, an imperial family who were famous not just, for their love of the, uh, not just for their love of the arts, but also nature, and who were constantly looking back in their poetry, in their art and history as much as their architecture, to their nomadic roots. But I think today, at a, at a time when, uh, a, a decade after, nearly after 9-11, uh, with ISIS marauding around the Middle East and with Islam a center of such conscious black negativity, um, I think it's very important also to see Agra um, representing something very important to world history, uh, more than just a lost, uh, a lost earthly paradise. For under the greatest of the Mughal emperors, Akbar, Mughal Agra aimed not just at creating a visual reminder and an attempt to physically mirror on earth the heavenly paradise, but also to reproduce on earth the great reconciliation promised in the afterlife. In the process, Akbar brought about one of history's supreme moments of free-spirited inquiry, religious tolerance, and open-minded syncretism, not things that most Westerners would automatically associate today with an Islamic ruler. For unlike the great rivals of the Ottomans, the Safavids, sorry, of the Mughals, the Ottomans or the Safavids, who ruled largely Muslim polities with small Christian minorities, the Mughal Empire was effectively built in partnership with India's Hindu majority and succeeded as much through diplomacy as by brute force. Akbar was a true humanist who strove for reconciliation of his Hindu and Muslim subjects and managed to unite them in the service of a coherent, multi-religious state. As emperor in the latter part of his reign, Akbar promoted Hindus to all levels in his administration. He married a Rajput princess, entrusted his army to his former Hindu opponent, Rajaman Singh of Jaipur, 
ended the jizya tax levied only on non-Muslims, ordered the translation of Sanskrit texts uh, and classics into Persian, codified minority rights, and filled his court with Hindu and Muslim artists and intellectuals. Akbar personally took on many Hindu and yogic practices, even becoming a vegetarian, criticizing meat eaters for having, quote, converted their inner sides where reside the mysteries of divinity into a burial ground for animals. So great an impression did all this make on his Hindu subjects that in some of the Bardic traditions of Rajasthan, Akbar came to be equated with the Hindu divinity Lord Ram. More remarkably still, to a modern world lazily used to thinking of Islam and Christianity as eternal enemies, both Akbar and his son Jahangir were enthusiastic devotees of Jesus and his mother Mary. Indeed, over the main gate uh, of the principal mosque at Fatipur Sikri is a Nask inscription which still bears the legend, Jesus, son of Mary, on whom be peace, said, the world is a bridge. Pass over it, but build no houses upon it. He who hopes for a day may hope for eternity, but the world endures but an hour. Spend it in prayer for the rest is unseen. Among the holy men Akbar worshipped, uh, welcomed to uh, Fatipur Sikri, were Jesuits from Goa, who are on the left of this picture, who he allowed to set up a chapel recently excavated by archaeologists. There, in 1580, to the astonished excitement of many of the assembled Jesuits, Akbar prostrated himself before images of Jesus, and later showed particular pleasure in the Jesuits' Christmas festival, where a crib was set up in the palace, adorned with satin and velvet, and sculptures of the Christ child, accompanied with placards proclaiming Gloria in excelsis Deo in Persian. Later, Portuguese clerics found that the gospel books brought by their predecessors had led to murals of Christ and the Christian saints being painted on the walls, not only of the palace, but also of nearby Muslim tombs and caravanserais. The emperor, wrote one father, has painted images of Christ our Lord and Our Lady in various places in the palace. And there are so many saints that you would say it was more like the palace of a Christian king than a Moorish one. These are some of the mogul images of the nativity. Uh, more copied partly from uh, uh, the books brought by the Jesuits to Goa, but indigenized. So you can see there's a bindi on the... This is from the Nana Fadnavis uh, album, now in the uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Museum in Bombay. The British Post Office chose this for a Christmas stamp about 10 years ago. Uh, and there were protests from Hindu groups who imagined that it had been made up by the British Post Office, that, uh, and they got it as an insult that uh, uh, Mary was shown uh, wearing a bindi, unaware that this was, in fact, part of the collection of one of the great uh, Maratha statesmen, Nanda Fadnavis, uh, and originally commissioned by uh, a Muslim emperor. So it shows how, in a sense, how much minds have narrowed today uh, from the open-mindedness of this period. There was an enormous project of translation of all the uh, Hindu classics uh, under both Akbar and Jahangir. This is uh, in the Met Museum. Uh, Naveena, who's in the audience, kindly showed this yesterday. Uh, and um, it's uh, Krishna raising Mount Govardhan with all the, um, this fantastic village India, the eternal India that you still see today, looking on in amazement uh, as he does it. Uh, again, a testament to the incredible spirit of inquiry uh, of the royal court. I don't know how many of you saw the amazing um, Deborah Diamond's wonderful yoga exhibition at the Priya Sackler last year. Uh, but this picture, again, is a sort of fantastic uh, symbol of the inquiring and uh, ecumenical nature uh, of this period. For what you have here is the earliest surviving image of a yoga position, commissioned uh, by the young Prince Salim, the next who would be um, uh, the Emperor Jahangir later, when he rebelled from his father and went off to Allahabad. 
and he sent the artists who came with him down from the fort in Allahabad to the confluence, Prayag, uh, where the Yamuna meets the Ganga. Uh, and uh, uh, he sent his favorite artist, Govardhan, down to actually make figure studies on, one presumes, on the riverbank of these yogis sitting uh, at Prayag. Um, and in this particular picture, um, it's possible, uh, certainly Deborah thinks, uh, that they actually took the face of the yogi uh, from uh, a, a gospel image of Christ. So you have a, a, a Chris, the face of Christ tacked onto a Hindu uh, yogi uh, commissioned by a Muslim Mughal emperor. It doesn't get more ecumenical than that. Uh, later moguls would commission this sort of thing, wonderful images of Kali, also uh, from the wonderful Met collection. Uh, spectacular, terrifying image. Tracking down the last remains of the great palaces of Agra, the remains of this, uh, this fragments surviving from this world today, amid the slums and factories of Agra, um, is not always easy. Agra is today one of the most crowded and polluted towns in northern India, uh, and the center of a surprisingly vicious leather mafia. Um, yet many of the old Mughal gardens survive. Of the original 45 gardens seen on the Jaipur map, um, Ebba Koch's research shows that traces are, uh, remain of around 15. But none are in a good state of repair. And only the Taj Mahal itself are the old, has the old waterworks functioning. The Yamuna River, as you can see from this image here, is both sluggish and polluted. There are no pleasure boats today plying on its waters, even if they, uh, and even if they did, not one of the old water gates, which used to be the primary access to these gardens, has still remained in workable repair. So it's very difficult to, to do what one can still do in Venice, obviously, to, to go into a gondola or a, 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 a vaporetto uh, and, uh, and see Venice as it was once seen. Um, it's as if uh, um, the hideous suburbs of Venice, uh, the, the maestri have sort of industrial suburbs, have invaded Venice in, in the case of Agra. Um, because today its waters are clogged and polluted and its people have turned inward in disgust. Yet for every mile, for miles in every direction, half collapsed and overgrown, robbed and reoccupied, tottering and disintegrating, neglected by all, lie the remains of 600 years of trans-Indian imperium, now lost in a sprawl of dirty factories and grubby warehouses, Hammams and palaces, thousand-pillared halls and mighty tomb towers, empty mosques and semi-deserted Mughal gardens have been converted today into leatherworks or just left to decay. There seems to be no end of the litter of ages. In almost every bazaar in the old city of Agra can be found fragmentary gateways or the remains of courtyards of forgotten and elaborately carved Mughal havelis or courtyard arcades. Yet these are rapidly being destroyed. In, in the 20 years I've been going there, uh, so many of these lovely old courtyard houses have just been destroyed to make way for new shopping centers as Agra expands outwards. Every year, a few more disappear, victims to unscrupulous property developers or more often unthinking bureaucrats. Sometimes it seems as if no other great city in the world is less loved or less cared for. There have been some attempts at closing down some particularly noxious factories in order to protect the marble of the Taj from acid rain. But there is little effective legislation protecting Indian vernacular architecture. And while archaeological sites predating the uh, British are granted a nominal guardianship, but very often very little real protection by the ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India, there is simply no system whatsoever of architectural listing and India's rich heritage of domestic architecture is entirely unprotected by the law. In the competition between development and heritage, it is the latter that inevitably gives way. There is also a second problem, which is both sort of political and cultural. 
Since the rise of the Hindu nationalist BJP, the Mughals themselves have come to be seen not as the kind of great glorious golden age of Indian history, but as foreign invaders. Um, today, if you wander around the roundabouts of Agra, you see images of Shivaji, uh, the Rani of Jhansi. Uh, even, uh, there's even a statue of Subhas Chandra Bose, but there's not a single statue anywhere in modern Agra of a single Mughal emperor. Um, and uh, rightly or wrongly, the Mughals are still perceived in modern India as the British, uh, as it suited the British to portray them as sensuous and decadent, temple-destroying outsiders. Uh, and this was an important part of British propaganda uh, in order to uh, tell Indians how lucky they were to have the British uh, to rescue them. <laughs> and those, the, the kind of... Um, the, the, the amazing figures like Darashuko or Akbar um, have little resonance with an urban middle class uh, who are deeply ambivalent about the achievements of the Mughals, even if they will happily eat a Mughal meal or flock to the cinema to watch Joda Akbar or some Bollywood Mughal epic, or indeed head to the Red Fort to hear their prime minister give the annual Independence Day speech from the battlements of the Lahore Gate. And this is a, a major impediment uh, to, I think, the preservation of Mughal monuments. Only last week, uh, Aurangzeb Road in Delhi was renamed. Um, today, India is a country with its eyes firmly on the coming century. Everywhere, there's a profound hope that the country's rising, rapidly rising international status will somehow compensate for a past that's now perceived as a long succession of invasions and defeats at the hands of foreign powers. Perhaps there's also a cultural factor here and the neglect of the past. As one conservation told me recently, you must understand, he said, that we Hindus burn our dead. Either way, the loss of Agra's past is irreplaceable, and future generations will look back at the conservation failures of the early 21st century with a deep sadness and sense of failure, lamenting with the great Mughal poet Ghalib, who was born and loved much of it, lived much of his early life in Agra, he wrote, we smashed the wine glass and the flask. What is it now to us if all the rain that falls from heaven should turn to rose-red wine? Yet it's not too late to save a great deal. Much of this neglect can still be overcome. The riverfront of Agra can still be reconstructed, the waterworks reconstituted, the mount fountains can play again amid replanted orchards, cool with shade and heavy with summer fruit, mangoes, papaya, China oranges, and lychees. And this is the ambitious task which the World Monuments Fund in India has set itself up as its principal project. Looking back now to the beginning of this story, Agra first became the capital of much of northern India under the Sultan Sikandar Lodi in 1505, about 20 years before this gentleman, Babur, uh, invaded India. In 1526, Zahiruddin Babur, a young Turkish poet prince from Fergana and now Uzbekistan, descended the Khyber Pass with a small army of hand-picked followers. And with him, he brought the first cannon seen in modern North India. And with these, he, def he defeated Sikandar Lodi's son Ibrahim at the Battle of Panipat and established his capital at Agra, where he be quickly began to build the first of a series of irrigated gardens complaining in his memoirs at the absence of properly designed symmetrical water gardens in Hindustan. Babu wrote one of the great diaries of history, com comparable to that of Pepys. It's an extraordinary record of a, a young man's searching in all sorts of different ways. Of course, his impression of falling for men or marrying women, the differing pleasures of opium and wine. Um, his son... Humayun preferred Delhi to Agra, and it was only under his grandson, Akbar, who returned to Agra. Uh, and, I, and after several years in his reign, when he uh, remained without an heir, uh, he went in search of one, and that led it back to Agra. Because in 1568, Akbar made the penitential walk from Ajmer to Sikri. This is... Uh, 
Uh, this belongs to the Annan family, this picture. I saw it at lunchtime today for the first time. A uh, wonderful picture of Ajmer Sharif from where um, Akbar sent off, uh, set off for Sikri. Uh, and he went to the small village which clustered around the hermitage of Sheikh Salim Chisti, Akbar's peer or spiritual guide. On arrival, the peer confidently predicted that Akbar would have two sons, and on the 30th of August, 1569, the first of these sons, Prince Muhammad Salim Mirza, the late Emperor Jahangir, was born here, in this house, at the back of uh, Fatipur Sikri, it, which is still owned by the descendants of the Sheikh, uh, whose senior member is here in this picture. And according to um, the peer, you could just see in the... Uh, I've got a pointer on this. Um, Anyway, there's a little kind of notched um, uh, uh, stone um, trough uh, at the edge of this building, uh, which, according to him, uh, in the tradition passed down by his family, is actually the cradle on which the young uh, Jahangir uh, was rocked. Uh, and as with so much of Fatipur Sikri, it's in the state of advanced decay, and um, its water buffaloes, hang on, uh, have some of the grandest uh, sh sheds ever built for livestock anywhere in the world. Uh, uh, soon after uh, he was, uh, his son was born, uh, the Emperor Akbar decided, in his own words, quote, to give outward splendor to this spot which possessed spiritual grandeur. In other words, to build Fatipur Sikri in honor of his peer. Uh, though what Salim Chisti thought of this invasion of his peace and quiet is not recorded, he can hardly have been thrilled that his remote place of spiritual repeat should be turned into the capital of the largest empire on earth. Work began in 1571, when Akbar was only 29, by which stage he'd have been emperor for 15 years, and he supervised the plans himself. As his biographer and friend Abel Faisal put it, when the engineer of sound judgment drew a line of its foundation on the paper of fancy, he ordered it to have a circumference of six miles on the face of the earth, and for houses to be built on top of the hill facing the lake, and that they should lay out orchards and gardens at its periphery and centre. The principles which guided Akbar in his project are still ones we recognise and respect today. He built his new city intending to translate his spiritual ideas into stone combining Hindu and Muslim elements in a single innovative and highly syncretic fusion style. Uh, and uh, having just conquered Gujarat, he brought a load of Gujarati uh, craftsmen uh, who built in a, in a Hindu Gujarati style, uh, mixing with it the arch and dome of Islam. Uh, and it's a, a fantastic symbol. This is a, an image of the city of Fatipur Sikri being built. You can see all the workmen with uh, uh, pans of cement on their uh, head and uh, carrying stones around and hammering the, uh, the, the stone into shape. And at this terrific pace, Fatipur Sikri rose in less than five years. Uh, he later, uh, there were complaints from his queens who'd moved into the palace that there was too much noise. So he ordered that all the stones should be dressed and put together uh, at some distance from the site, and then sort of brought like a sort of great IKEA construction kit uh, into uh, the, the city ready-made. Um, and he turned it into a philosophical laboratory for his spiritual inquiries. Holy men of India's different religions were invited to the city to make their case for the particular understanding of the metaphysical. And I think it's important to remember what was going on at the West at this stage, when uh, Akbar is inviting... Jews from Cochin, Jains, Buddhists from the Himalayas, uh, Sunnis, Shias, Sufis, Vaishnavites and Shaivites, all this fantastic uh, panoply of different religions in India. Uh, when this is going on in Fatipur Sikri, uh, when they are being called to uh, discuss uh, the, the possibilities of searching for religious truth with such diversity, at this point in, in London, for example, Catholics are having their entrails ripped out at the Tyburn and being hung, drawn and quartered 
Uh, so we should always think twice before we I think, lecture the Islamic world about how we are the center of religious tolerance and uh, how we have this wonderful history. Because I think Akbar is, a, is, is this remarkable <laughs> figure that gains saying so much of what we think of Islam today. Akbar's thesis was that the pursuit of reason rather than the reliance on marshy land of tradition was the proper way to address religious disputes. Attacked by traditionalists who argue in favor of instinctive faith in Islamic tradition, Akbar Trod told his trusted Lieutenant Abu Faisal, the pursuit of reason and the rejection of traditionalism are so brilliantly patent as to be above the need for argument. If traditionalism were proper, the prophets would merely have followed their own elders and not come with new messages. One set of foundations he forgot to lay, however, were more terrestrial or precise hydraulic. He never secured enough water uh, for his great capital city, and before long, the main center of Mughal administration returned to Agra. Today, most of Fatipur Sikri lies in ruins. Uh, and uh, immediately under the gate, crouches the modern Indian village with mud brick huts, pumps pumping, women winnowing, goats milking, chilies being fried, babies weaned, an old gentleman relaxing in the sun. Um, beyond the roof of the huts, bright red with chilies left out to dry on them, scattered over dry rocky sandstone ridge which rises up from below the gateway, lies the wreckage of dismantled caravanserais and the foundations of gutted bazaars, octagonal fountains and chamfered water channels that once lay at the center of the gardens, and elaborate archways that once led into the harem quarters, lie scattered all around. Only one of the great imperial palace complex remains intact, uh, and the mosque at its center encloses the exquisite white latticed marble tomb of Sheikh Salim Chisti at the top of the ridge. Uh, and it's behind that, unknown to most tourists, at the large courtyard house of the Chisti family, who still live behind the great mosque in the collapsing grandeur of their old residence, desperately trying to keep the house on the roof where Jahangir was born and where his cradle still lies. This is another project which the World Monuments Fund uh, is offering help with. History, I think, has come a full circle for this Sufi family. Briefly, they've seen their home village become the bustling capital of one of the world's great empires, but then the emperor walked away from his creation and the courtiers followed. Today, the Chistis remain in what has once again become, despite its glorious past, a rural Indian village. It was this beautiful, latticed, marble jewel box that Akbar built for Sheikh Salim Chisti that inspired the next generation of Mughal builders. In 1622, Jahangir's Prime Minister, Mirza Gius Beg, known as Itmad Dawla. Here we are. Also from the Met collection, um, or pillar of the state, died on his way back from his summer capital in Kashmir. Here he is shown with Jahangir. He was a wise and perfect vizier, wrote the emperor in his diary of his father-in-law, and a learned and affectionate companion. And the job of uh, building a memorial to Itmad Dawla fell to Jahangir's wife, Noor Jahan, who also happened to be Itmad Dawla's daughter. Uh, Noor Jahan, this is a, a much later picture by Sita Ram and, and probably completely mythical, but nonetheless, she was a famous beauty and an exceptional and talented woman. Accomplished poet, influential designer of carpets and a good shot. She hunted from a closed howdah on the back of an elephant, but she also seems to be the faithful and loving wife. And she was ambitious as she was beautiful and had no qualms about using her influence over her husband for her own ends. According to Sir Thomas Rowe, the English ambassador, all justice, care, or anything of public affairs either sleeps or depends with her, who is more inaccessible than goddesses, a mystery of heathen piety. The Itmad Dawla was, I remember, the first mogul tomb I ever saw. I was 18 and the spring morning I spent here has propelled me since then, kept me enraptured with this architecture ever since. It is the most extraordinary building. 
and revisiting it this year, exactly 30 years after my first visit, uh, it remains really as lovely uh, as when I first saw it, with this wonderful inlaid stonework all over it. These jars and vessels and flowers. The most beautiful work. The shadow play of light on its lattices and the symbolism of paradise and the jewel-like mosaics that cover almost every foot of its surface, as alluring as it was uh, to my, now, as it was to my untutored eyes in 1984. And it's wonderful to know that the World Monuments Fund plans to build, uh, plans to mend its hydraulics and replant its gardens, so as to restore it to its original appearance, exactly as Noor Jahan planned it, with the runnels running and the fountains gushing. Um, rather surprisingly, I discovered in the, when I was writing White Moguls that, um, that my family is actually married into Imad al-Dawla's family. Um, the Imad al-Dawla's younger daughter was married off to the Nawab of Mazuli Patam, uh, and in 1775, one of my ancestors, James Dalrymple, married Muti Begum, who was the daughter of the Nawab of Mazuli Patam. So having spent so long... Um, loving this from a distance. It's rather odd to find that I'm actually related to the family. The Imad Dala and its use of flawless white, white marble and its interplay with the sandstone and these wonderful, playful, inlaid patterns influenced the greatest of all Mughal monuments, the Taj Mahal itself. The Taj lies just around the bend of the Amana from the Madudala, and like it was designed to be a model and symbol on earth of the heavenly mansion prepared for the imperial dead in paradise. It was also very deliberately designed to be a political monument of propaganda to the power and glory, genius and good taste of its builder, Jahangir's son, Shah Jahan. A dome of high foundation and a building of great magnificence was created wrote Shah Jahan's favorite court historian, Muhammad Amin Kazwini. The eye of the age has seen nothing like it under the nine vaults of the enamel blue sky, and the ear of time has heard nothing like it in any past age. It will be a masterpiece for ages to come and increase in amazement of all humanity until the day of resurrection. Like the tombs of Salim Chistin it would dial but on a far greater scale, the mausoleum was also built in white marble in memory of Mumtaz Mahal, the chosen one of the palace, Shah Jahan's favorite wife, and a memorial to their extraordinary marriage. In the words of Kazwini, the intimacy, deep affection, attention, and favor which His Majesty had for the cradle of excellence, another of Mumtaz's titles, exceeded by a thousand times what he felt for any other. And always that lady of the age was the companion, close confidant, associate, and intimate friend of that successful ruler in hardship and comfort, joy and grief, when in traveling or in residence. The mutual affection and harmony between the two had reached a degree never seen between a husband and wife among sultans or rulers or among ordinary people. And this was not merely one of sexual passion. The excellent qualities, pleasing habits, outward and inner virtues and physical and spiritual compatibility on both sides caused great love and affection, an extreme affinity and familiarity. Now, it's directly opposite the Taj that lies the World Monuments Fund other project in Agra, the, the recently rediscovered Matabag, or the Moonlight Garden. If you, this is a wonderful uh, late Mughal company school image of the Taj complex. You can see the gateway at the front, the, uh, the garden then planted very thickly with trees, not the lawns that the British reimagined on this thing, uh, but an orchard thickly planted. And then the terrace, the monument itself, the Amuna, and beyond it, the second half of the monument, Matabag, uh, built as Shah Jahan planned it as the best possible place for viewing his supreme architectural wonder. It's the same width as the Taj complex and situated facing opposite on the other side of the waters of the Amana. As early as 1665, the French traveler Jean-Baptiste Tavernier was told that Shah Jahan had planned to build his own tomb here 
on the opposite bank of the Taj, a direct mirror of the tomb of Mumtaz, except that the emperor's tomb will be in black marble and linked to the Taj by a bridge. The legend has lived on ever since then, but excavations carried out under the supervision of uh, PBS Sengar of the Archaeological Survey of India, uh, now the World Monuments Fund main advisor on its Agra projects, have revealed that the legend has no discernible substance. While it's quite possible that the Shah Jahan did not intend to join his wife in the Taj and had other plans in mind for himself, why else would he have given her the center place of honor at the center of the complex and left no room in the cenotaph for himself? The Martab Bagh shows every sign of being an integral, if forgotten, part of the original conception. Within the last decade, in a project championed by uh, Elizabeth Moynihan uh, in association with the ASI, the Martab Bagh has been restored and replanted uh, and shows magnificently what can be done. Uh, the trees, which uh, when, even a decade ago were small saplings, are now swelling and growing. Uh, and it's the one place to, uh, in a few years where you really will be able to get the sensation of a mogul garden as an orchard, as a place of shade and fruit, rather than this sort of anglicized lawn that one sees everywhere else. Um, the World Monuments Fund now plans to complete the project by restoring the waterworks and planting of landscapes of the garden to something approaching its original glory. Agra is the wonder of the age, wrote the Mughal chronicle, chronicler Abdul Aziz in the 1640s. The city is as much the center of the arteries of trade by land and water as a meeting place of saints, sages, and scholars from all Asia. A veritable lodestar for artistic workmanship, literary talent, and spiritual worth. With a fair wind, there's some hope that, thanks to the collaborative work of the World Monuments Fund and the ASI, that Agra can once again become a wonder of the age and an example to the rest of South Asia as to what a really dedicated, collaborative conservation project can achieve. Thank you. Isn't Willie mesmerizing? <laughs> One reviewer has described him as one who researches like a historian, thinks like an anthropologist, and writes like a novelist. On behalf of World Monuments Fund, we're very grateful to him. I understand that a selection of his books will be offered outside this auditorium and that he's willing to autograph some. Good evening, I'm Peter Kimmelman a trustee for more than 30 years of WMF, and with my wife, uh, Albrin, longtime friends of Willie and Olive Dalrymple. Let's revert back to the World Monuments Fund. We have numerous dramatic and ambitious projects underway. They need to meet the important criteria set forth by WMF's great benefactor, Bob Wilson. Um, there are five or six criteria, but certainly among the most important are beauty and also philanthropic leverage and impact. Um, a perfect illustration are the Mogul Gardens. Uh, visitors in the 17th century would have first view the Taj Mahal from the vantage point, as we heard from Willie, of the gardens, which were intended to be in the direct sight line of that of the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal, to state the obvious, has to be one of the most uh, iconic buildings in the world. It's hard to imagine a beauty that's more universally acknowledged than that structure. Let's look at Bob Wilson's other criteria, philanthropic leverage. This project covers two gardens. One is about 10 acres, the other about 25 acres. Um, it will uh, involve the restoration of both gardens, 
the redoing of the uh, sprinkler and water system, uh, the creation of a visitor center and offering an interpretation of the gardens. Uh, we've made a commitment of a million six in cash, and that's being matched in kind by the Indian government and by the Archaeological Survey of India. Um, their 50% share is contributed by labor and materials. In terms of labor, we're not being billed at the New York State soon to be mandated $15 an hour. Uh, our, the average laborers there are paid about three or four dollars an hour, skilled artisans. Uh, by my arithmetic, that's a 25 times ratio. Chris Orstrom mentioned that we intend to develop a group of supporters in New York and elsewhere in the country uh, specifically to support projects in India. But however glorious the uh, Mogul Gardens are, uh, we have lots of other significant projects, beautiful ones offering leverage, and we would love to interest some of you in those. So there are WM F people here, please approach us this evening or um, any time at our offices. Uh, we'd love to get you involved. Thank you. <laughs>